and all I had to do was use my imagination. I do not believe the conditions that produced a situation that demanded a song like that. Hello everyone and welcome to session three of the Global Black Feminist Reading Circle. My name is Randy Henderson and I am one of the Black Feminist Reading Circle members of this online group. This session runs from January 20th until June 2nd and includes two week long breaks. Our democratically selected reading material is Harriet A. Washington's book, Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present. Our book group meets each Tuesday evening from 6.30 to 8 on the Google Plus Hangouts on Air platform. You may find the, Glo the Global Black Feminist Reader Circle on Google Plus, YouTube, and Facebook. And always feel free to join us in reading our story together. Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. And welcome to our, I guess this is meeting 10. Yep. Of the Global Black Feminist Reading Circle. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> and we are continuing our uh, reading of Chapter 8, The Black Stork, The Eugenic Control of African American Production. And if we can go around and just have everyone introduce themselves and tell me where you're from, let's start with uh, Edwina. 
Hi. I hope everyone had a nice um, Easter holiday up here in Utah. Thank you, Edwina. And Kim? Hi, I'm Kim. I'm in uh, New York. Hi, Kim. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I missed y'all last week. Missed you, too. You. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. And Randy? Hi, I'm Randy. I'm watching from Atlanta, and it's good to see everybody. And Vanita? Hi, you introduce? everyone. Um, I hope everyone had a, a restful and uh, reflective weekend. My name is Vanita Walker, and I'm joining you from Cromwell, Connecticut. All right. Thank you. And Michelle? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the the Reading Circle. My name is Michelle Odom. I am one of the co-hosts uh, of the group with Randy Danielle, and I am located in Brooklyn, New York. All right. Thank you. And I'm Georgette Moses. I'm in Columbia, South Carolina, and I'm your moderator for tonight's session. We can get started on Chapter 8, The Black Stork, The Eugenic Control of African American Reproduction. The Black Stork, The Eugenic Control of African American Reproduction. This chapter illustrates the various ways the reproductive freedom of African Americans have been assaulted by discouraging the birth of inferior black children and by curtailing the fertility of black mothers. Americans of various backgrounds and allergenes, allergenes, allegiances. allegiances participated in this eugenics movement. Germans and Americans shared their flawed eugenics practice and beliefs, many of them evolving into current laws and social economic and medical policies today. Many women and men have been harmed by these codified beliefs with no compensation. Some of our own black leaders were complicit in this. We still live with the false specter of the crack baby, stigmatized teenage girls as hypersexual and chose to punish and medicate rather than counsel and protect. Okay. Thank you, Vanita. See, the, the Mississippi appendectomy. At the beginning of the chapter, Washington relates the painful experience of one of our greatest civil rights champions, Fannie Lou Hamer. As a young woman in 1961, she goes to the doctor's office for a simple operation and ends up having a hysterectomy. The doctor never told her. She had to find out through gossip on the plantation where she worked as a sharecropper. She had no power over her own body and no power to seek restitution. Challenging the white doctor in court would mean her death. The compulsory surgical sterilization experienced by African Americans at the hands of medical doctors was invasive, permanent, and the most damaging threat to their reproductive freedom. It was also very common. Germany began their eugenic sterilization program in 1934, but 17 states in the United States had already been performing routine sterilizations for some time. Between 2,000 and 4,000 operations were performed that year alone on the mentally unfit, quote unquote, feeble-minded, those on welfare or those with genetic defects. By 1941, Washington estimates that between 70,000 and 100,000 Americans had been forcibly sterilized. 
She states that African Americans have always been staggeringly overrepresented in these ranks. The North Carolina Eugenics Commission sterilized 8,000 mentally retarded persons in the 1930s, and 5,000 of them were black. Washington also says this was achieved through the govern through the government led government fed might of the lazy. Uh, am I reading this right? Oh yeah, that's it's in there. That's, that's it. <laughs> Washington also says this was achieved through the government fed might of the lazy, hyper fertile welfare mother. In 1958, a bill in Mississippi forcing welfare mothers to be sterilized advertised as a means to discourage immorality of unwed mothers and was pre presented to the state legislature. Thankfully, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, killed the bill through public protest and pamphlets against the genocide in Mississippi. Question seven. It's ironic that during slavery, black women were forced to procreate, and now they are forcibly sterilized by government welfare programs. How does this make you feel? Question eight. America spends a lot of time and effort condemning the Nazi party and their ideology of national socialism for atrocities like this. Why do you think we have not turned that same magnifying glass on ourselves and revealed all the perpetrators? Any questions or comments? Yes. It's ironic that during slavery, black women were forced to procreate. Now they're forced to be sterilized by government welfare programs. How does this make you feel? Well, uh, it's, it's pretty logical. Um, we were forced to procreate because we were incredible wonders. We were the new vendors. Now we're forced, without permission, to be paralyzed because we are no longer the proper wonders. We, they, we, they don't need us for anything anymore. Slavery is over. Sharecropping is over. So there's no need for you to have a baby every 14 months. So that you are a good uh, breeder. It's mathematics. It's economics. Mm. Yes. How do I feel about that? I don't have any particular feelings about that because it's just we know what we're dealing with. We know what the mindset was in a lot of cases still is. So. Um, we're just not needed to do that anymore. And the second question I wanted to address is Americans spend a lot of time and effort condemning the Nazi party. I don't know why. Because we, they actually, uh, Hitler was following our suit. So I, I don't understand why. Um, but I do understand why the magnifying glass is on ourselves because our country has always been the sweep the dirt under the kind of rug type of country, mm. especially when it comes to black folk. Now, you might be some other folk, you know, they may raise an eyebrow, but they've always tried to sweep the dirt under the rug. Um, as a matter of fact, um, at some point, um, in this slavery, was all about uh, other folks knowing what we were doing. You know, not about us doing wrong, this country, 
but being embarrassed by other nations for our, you know, how we treated a uh, black uh, folks here. Um, so I, 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 I don't know. We contradict ourselves, and it, once again, it depends on who you are. I'm done. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Well said. Thank you, Vanita. You're welcome. Anyone else? I see a lot of thinking going on out there. <laughs> Can I just quote something from um, the ISIS paper uh, pertaining to um, the, uh, the problems that the Nazis had with the Jews? And she says here in, that, in my view, that the word Semite is uh, derived from the Latin prefix Semite, Semite, which means head. Semites of the Jewish religion are persons from Africa who were half black and half white. Black plus white always equals color. Mean persons carrying in their genetic makeup some capacity to produce melanin pigmentation and in some instances a genetic capacity to produce kinky hair. Jews who left Africa and went to Europe were colored people when they arrived there hundreds of years ago. So European whites never have forgotten the Semite capacity for the genetic dominance of the Aryan white population. Although after much um, intermixing, many Jews lost much of their skin color. They have continued to be identified as fellow people from Africa by whites. So I just wanted to um, read that passage, and I think it's a clarification why the Nazis had a problem with um, the Jewish um, peoples. They didn't want these so-called colored people uh, procreating, and they, they wanted to maintain they are Aryan superior, superior race. That's true. Okay. Thank you, Edwina. Welcome. Question seven. It's ironic that during slavery, black women were forced to procreate, and now they are forcibly sterilized by government welfare programs, how does that make you feel? Well, I think I heard Vanita say they don't need each other, they don't need us anymore. And that's why they're sterilizing, sterilizing us, and I agree completely. But, you know, how does it, how does it make me feel? I mean, I, I, I said last week, and I guess I, I, I'll keep, I'll say it again and keep on saying it. Black women have had to contend with black men, white men, and and even white women somehow thinking that they had the right to control our bodies. And and personally, I resent it. <laughs> Uh, I resent it. I do not feel good about uh, the idea of anyone else uh, thinking that they should have any say about my body. And, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, we, we can have another discussion about black women and their children. But for the most part, we don't have stories of black women or black people going around the world forcing our will on other people. And I, you know, uh, maybe we're not strong enough to do that, but I think it's more that we don't have a desire to do that. So I don't really even understand where where people get the idea that they have a right to make decisions about other people's lives and bodies and 
Um, it's it's you know it's a terrible feeling. So I don't know what I want to say exactly, Georgette, but I just wanted to bring in a little bit of the emotion around it because it's just it's a it's a bad feeling. Yes, and I, I appreciate you bringing that out. Absolutely, Michelle, because I think, like uh, Benita said, she doesn't feel anything. And I was kind of in between of feeling, you know, awful about it and feeling nothing. But is that, and I wondered if that was not feeling, is a way of dealing with it so you can keep functioning right now. Yeah. yeah. So, I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Um, I agree with, with what you're saying. I just I just feel like the question makes me think and I, I couldn't see what I was feeling for um, a while. And what it comes down to is the internalized racism that that puts in my DNA almost. That on one hand you can, you can rape me and force me to have your children and then you decide when it's okay for me to stop having any children. And it just feels like the more I look like you, the safer I am. Mm -hmm. The more I assimilate to being like you, the safer I am in my own body, in my own country. And that, mm -hmm. that's what comes up for me, is this feeling of just not being safe. Yeah, and, and valued, you know, for me, I mean, I don't want to cut you off. Am I cutting you off? No, yet? I'm good. I'm good. You know, every time I, I, I think about that expression, Black Lives Matter, the thought in my head is always, to whom? You know, um, I, I think we've been through so much as a people that to a large extent, we don't even matter much to ourselves. And so, and so, you know, when you when when you kill our babies before they get here, after they get here, and treat them any kind of way, uh, I I think it just it 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 makes me feel like we don't matter. Mm -hmm. um, I would just like to say I resent the fact that it has been said that black women do not make good mothers. Mm -hmm. I mean, that went through me. And it made me think about my grandmother and my aunties and how precious these people were in all the love and affection and attention that they gave us so that we could grow up to be decent human beings. If that to me really went through me, say that yeah. black women do not make good mothers. And logically I I thought, well, if we were at one point, slaves and made to produce children and to take care of their children, how come all of a sudden we can't take care of our own children? That, that's that's not, that doesn't make sense. That's right. I think that, that there is a question in terms of how much time can you give to your own child if you're taking care of someone else's child and that you have to work two or three substandard jobs to take care of that same child. You just can't be at every PTA meeting and you, you may have the older children taking care of the younger children. Mm -hmm. So True. I think that the love is there, but I think that there are obstacles to parenting that are part of this overall system of racism. Absolutely. True, true. Mm -hmm. To me, I guess the, the question, at first I was feeling like Vanita 
when we read it last week, I'm like really numb to it and not really feeling anything. But now we're uh, reading it, I feel a little liberated by this chapter, um, especially because mainly because I completely understand through reading this book, like for real, that whiteness is crazy and whiteness mm -hmm. is fearful, and um. I have seen through these chapters what fear, like for real deep fear and um and like evil can do to somebody and trying to like live my life around these and these body types, you know, um I just feel so free from it because it's never gonna matter. Um it's you know, it's evident that as long as they maintain um power, whiteness and in general, they really can't control the narrative. And I'm I'm a little sick of them controlling the narrative, and so this just while it is heartbreaking and you know I do worry I just I feel a little free now when I because I I think I understand now that they're just you know that they're crazy and I don't want to give them any more power in terms of how I view myself or view my people. So good, yeah. I'm ha I'm happy to hear that. Thank you. Because, you know, Randy, sometimes Benita and I talk about you. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we, we get worried that we might be scaring the bejeebas out of you. <laughs> no. <laughs> and, but I always say Randy can handle it. <laughs> I'm okay, y'all. All right. I always oh, okay. say I got to make sure my baby is so cat. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm worried, wow. Randy. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. So, well, there's there was another question. Let me see about that one. America spends a lot of time and effort condemning the Nazi Party and their ideology of national socialism for atrocities like this. Why do you think we have not turned that same magnifying glass on ourselves and revealed all the perpetrators? I actually love that question, Georgette, because I think that it is such a human phenomena to be able to see weaknesses and issues, problems, criticisms in other people, um, but to have great difficulty seeing them in ourselves and um, I'm trying to think of the expression my, expression my mother used to use. I can't think of it exactly, but it was something about if we could only see ourselves the way others see us, you know. Um, and, and I think it's just hard to do to, to really take an honest look at yourself. I strive to do it, and I still think it's it's hard. You know, and and I think that people project things onto us, and so we get in the habit of denying what they're projecting because sometimes it, it you know it's wrong and it, and it needs to be denied. But if you do that all the time, if you do it as a sort of knee-jerk first reaction, no, you're wrong. You know, that's not me. Um, then you risk shutting down your capacity to to take in valid uh, criticism, valid feedback. So you know, so I so I think a part of the the reason that Americans can point their finger at Nazis in horror is 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 that. But you know, but more than that, I think the the bigger reason is, you know, we are in the belly of the beast. That you know, that means. Um, you know, we have taken uh, man's capacity to to be inhumane toward other men to a level that, you know, the world just hasn't seen until Americans came along 
and um, um, we didn't necessarily invent everything, uh, but but we have ratcheted it up significantly, and so there's just a lot of uh, self-interest involved that that won't let us tell the truth. I'm done. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Oh, you ladies went deep in those questions. <laughs> All right. 